This week on Wealth Track, great investor Robert Kessler explains why he is standing firm while others stampede out of U.S. Treasury bonds. Riding against the bond selling herd is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. One of the distinguishing characteristics of our great investor and financial thought leader guests is their independence of thought and their contrarian investment views. They don't intentionally set out to go against the herd, but frequently their analysis leaves them there. Recently, for the first time in Wealth Track's nine year history, however, I have noticed an exception to this rule. Surprisingly, the vast majority of our guests are in sync with Wall Street sentiment on the subject of bonds and U.S. Treasury bonds in particular. The prevailing view is that after more than three decades of declines, interest rates are going up and therefore the great bond rally of the last 30 plus years is over. The popular prediction, the multi-year decline in bond prices has begun and as several guests have warned, bonds are now downright dangerous. Well, not so fast, says this week's great investor guest, Robert Kessler. He points out that we have been here before. Over the last six years, there have been numerous times when the bond markets have sold off and yields have gone up on signs that the economy was improving or predictions that central banks were about to tighten policy. None of those expectations lasted and each time interest rates went back down to near previous lows. Robert Kessler is the founder and CEO of Kessler Investment Advisors, a manager of fixed income portfolios with a concentration in U.S. Treasury debt for institutions and high net worth individuals around the world. He has correctly defended the value of treasuries against Wall Street naysayers for more than the decade that I have been interviewing him. I began our conversation by asking Kessler about his recent report titled Nothing Has Changed, in which he predicts the secular trend of lower interest rates will continue and interest rates will eventually fall to new lows. I was on the show um, last July, August. And if you look at today's market versus last year's uh, period of time, we have GDP that's substantially lower than the GP GDP last year. We have inflation that's substantially lower than last year. We seem to have a huge number of people that are unemployed or underemployed, even more people on food stamps, and this division in the country that, if anything, has gotten wider. And the process that we've been in, we'd like to make it three or four years like it is, but it takes a long time in a credit recession like we've had, where debt has to be deleveraged, debt has to be paid back, before there's enough money to create the demand to move markets. And so every time we've had a QE, some sort of right. stimulus. Quantitative easing, stimulus quantitative from the easing, Fed. Some right. sort of stimulus on a monetary basis. Every time we've had one, as we got to the end of it, we suddenly had interest rates going down, and we had economies that suddenly weren't doing what people thought they would do, which is to improve. And in that process, we've kind of ratcheted rates lower and lower and lower. And it would appear, if we look honestly at the economy right now, that things really don't appear that much better, but for one main reason different than last year. And that is that we have a global marketplace. We have Europe with 12% unemployment, an unheard of number really. We have commodity markets that are heading down because there isn't any demand in the global marketplace. We have the fear of China, which is a bigger fear, that China slows down. So all of these things continue this process of either deleveraging 
or paying down debt. And we also have governments that don't want to do very much from the fiscal side. So when we write a piece like this... That nothing has changed, right. That nothing has changed. In many ways, things have changed, but they haven't gotten better. And because they haven't gotten better, the history of these kinds of markets, and we have to look at it period by period. We can't look at the 80s and 90s and say, well, the average rate of treasuries was 6% during the last 25 years. The fact of the matter is that's not a good period of time to look at. We should look at the 40s and 50s. That's 10 years after a credit recession, a terrible depression in the United States. In the 40s and 50s, we never saw interest rates much higher than 2.5%. So this idea we're going to go back to normal or normal C at 4% or 5% or 6% because that's what we think is normal it becomes a little silly. So, so one of the things, of course, that you, know, you are one of the few people that is saying, in fact, that the 10-year Treasury is probably going to go, go back and test its old lows of 1%. 10-year Treasuries tend to yield just about... Um, 1% over the cost of money, which happens to be zero, so if you don't accept 1%, I'll right. go to the next step, then actually 10-year treasuries on balance have yielded about 1% more than the inflation rate. That's what they do. Now, the inflation rate happens to be someplace around 1.5%, so you could say they should yield 25 That's reasonable, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. But for very long periods of time, the 10-year treasury yields about 1% less than those rates. Okay, that would be in the 1% range then. So there's lots and lots of things that people can point at and say, this is where they've been. But the most important thing has to be, so tell me if there's any demand out there for money. Um, you and I were talking a little bit about money earlier. Right. And, and money is fascinating to me, cash is the most interesting facet, I think, of this market. And the reason I think cash is so interesting is because Wall Street, the sell side of the business, tells everyone you cannot keep cash because you're gonna be losing money because inflation will eat into it. Right, you're gonna lose your purchasing power. You're gonna lose your cash purchasing power. Cash is trash, is Cash is right. trash. Uh, and, and this makes absolutely no sense, especially during this period of time, for this reason. A lot of smart money, and we all have a tendency to say, Corporations are very smart because they're sitting with two or three trillion dollars in cash. Right, record levels of cash. I don't notice them doing anything with it. They're not organically growing because there's not enough demand to go build a factory to sell something, so they keep the cash. And they don't want to buy another company because that's not going to improve their bottom line too much. It certainly won't improve their revenues much if the demand doesn't pick up. So they keep this cash and everyone says, well, why do they keep this cash? I suspect they keep the cash because they think something will be cheaper later on. There was an interesting study that came out today that said that rich people, very well-to-do wealthy people, are keeping more cash than they ever kept before. So if all these things look so good that we're being told we have to go out and mm -hmm. buy, why are all these very smart people keeping all this cash? And my guess is that they expect to be able to buy something cheaper at a later date, and that is deflationary. Right. And, and let me just add to that, because certainly, as you know, we talk to great investors such as yourself. Many of them are, are equity investors. And, you know, by and large, they are all sitting, these portfolio managers, on fairly substantial amounts of cash, mm -hmm. these value investors, and we talk to them every week. So th there are people out there who do value cash they're not looking at it, as, as you just said, as, as that they're losing purchasing power. In fact, they're looking at it as it's going to give me purchasing power when things are cheaper. So to your point. C right. Cash is even more amazing than that because going back to when we spoke last time, had you waited a year, you virtually could buy any commodity out there, including gold, including most things, 20% cheaper. Okay, so cash was worth 20% on that basis, assuming you wanted to spend it. The only market that really moved was the equity market. And, and going back to the piece that we wrote, we've actually seen this before. We get this tremendous anticipation of, I know things are going to get better. For sure they're going to get better. So we need to buy equities. And what we find out 
is that the earnings are really not meeting up to expectations, but that's okay because equities can go up in spite of earnings. Okay, well, what about the GDP? That doesn't look so good. Well, equities can go up in spite of the GDP. Can they go up really in a disinflationary, deflationary environment where you can't raise your price for anything? Then you have no future earnings or potential to make more money. So finally, at a certain point in markets, which is what we've seen two or three times, we get these spurts and then, oh my God, and the market comes back down. And I suspect that's what happens with uh, interest rates. Mm -hmm. Since they are simply a commodity, and they will probably come down like any other commodity. So to expect them to go uh, back to 1.5% or 1% or um, is not a tremendous expectation. This is not weird stuff, I'm saying. This is stuff we have seen consistently in economies that are developed. And we in the United States, which is interesting, our 10-year Treasury at roughly 260 today is cheaper than... 10 or 15 developed countries like a name, whether it's Japan or whether it's Norway or Sweden or England or Germany, we are the cheapest out there. At and when you say cheaper, you mean the... Meaning, meaning we have the highest yield and therefore mm -hmm. the most opportunity. So of course that's the great fear that Ben Bernanke has, sure. is, is that, that we are going to be in one of these, a prolonged period of deflation. To, now if you look at the statistics, we don't have deflation right now we have moderate inflation. So, so you know, what, is, do you think, what do you think the reality the, the, is? The fear is, and his fear, as is everyone else who looks at that, is that you go into a Japanese-style situation where we just talked about cash, where people sit back and they say, you know, I think I won't do anything. I won't buy anything today because it may be cheaper tomorrow, but I don't think I want to do it. Right. That is the great fear of every... Uh, central banker, because that means you're not spending money, the demand is going to disappear in the marketplace, and... No, there goes growth, there goes what's employment. What's, interesting, there what's goes interesting about that in the United States is that the United States, we have not been savers for decades. In the past, it was the United States who bought their own debt. So if we had a treasury problem, it was U.S. citizens who went in and said, we're going to own treasuries because we can't lose. We get our money back. It may not be great in between, but we right. get our money back, and we'll buy the treasuries. Now, it's China and Japan. That's good, and it's bad. They're buying our treasuries, They're right? buying our treasuries. It's good because it's nice to be a reserve currency. You can't be a reserve currency unless everyone wants to kind of play in your backyard. So that's good. What's not good is that we haven't been savers, and so we can't build this demand that people would like automatically to happen unless we start saving. And one of the ways probably as people get older and they want to save and they get scared of markets, they buy treasuries. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's another reason why the rates will come down because even though the demand may not appear to be there right now, um, as probably the baby boomer generation has to put money aside and as they feel not comfortable with the equity market, they probably will buy something as a saver that they know they'll get the money back. And they'll not be so concerned with being an investor where they're taking risk. And that's the nature to this market. So y you say the treasuries are really easy to understand. Yes, they are and very easy. And yet we have had, you know, basically 30 years of people who completely missed what interest rates were going to be, that, you know, completely no, missed this enormous it's decline. Not a, it's not like everyone misses it. It's what you see in terms of Wall Street in terms of the profit motivation of a bunch of really um, bizarre people. I mean, really, I mean, and, and it's gotten worse and worse. I mean, this is the worst. And so when you say, uh, why isn't everyone seeing that over the last 25, 30 years? I think, I think they do. I just think that it's not a valid sales tool for Wall Street. So can't, I, you can't make enough money selling treasuries. can't make enough treasuries. money. I mean, how can you? And, Better than that, it's visible. It's transparent. The Treasury market. The Treasury market. Every single day they tell you what it is. There's no secrets. And, and the bid and ask is negligible. So what a perfect market for people to be in. And yet you're told the last thing you want is a Treasury. 
So what the stock market proponents are saying is, look, you know, we're up 150 percent from the the lows in in the financial crisis in the stock market, which is a very good return. And in fact, that that you know that that's where the growth is, and that's how you you can preserve your purchasing power, and that because companies can grow, whereas if you have a you own a bond, you have a fixed coupon, and you know you'll get your principal back in a treasury, but you're only going to get two and a half percent, for instance, on a, on a ten-year note in ten years. Whereas with uh, with equities, uh, you know, with dividends and reinvesting dividends and stock buybacks, there are all sorts of things that managers can do yeah. to basically increase your return. I mean, so what not, about that it, argument? It, it's not my position to sit and tell you what I think is going to hap happen to the equity market. Right. Um, we, but, somehow we're very convenient to talk about from 2009 to today, it's up X percent. We, we all tend to forget that we were all there when it dropped 50% right. and we're all getting even and we're not even getting even with inflation. So the getting even or beating it or something like that, I, I think I, I talk about the fact that treasuries are kind of an inverse corollary to, an in, in, inverse in correlation to uh, all other markets. Um, treasuries, no matter what happens, do extremely well when things do badly. Right. Okay, well, that's a good reason that you should have some treasuries. In your portfolio, yeah, absolutely. Because something's always going to happen. I mean, you will get terrible things happening, whether it's stock markets or whatever nonsense you get. But at the same time... And cash is the same, has the same and, function in a portfolio. And so when we talk about that correlation not being there, right. the other reason you have a treasury is because it will be there. That the treasury will be there. The treasury right. will, will be there, assuming, look, assuming that people don't make the... Well, if the United States is here and all that kind of silliness. The fact of the matter is you will get your money back. And no one says you have to do it for 30 years, which I would recommend. But you can do it for one year or one day or five years. You will get your money back. So there should be a part of portfolios that do that. And yet, when you listen to anything these days from Wall Street, what is the one thing you do not want under any condition? A treasury. Right. The, the, the most and dangerous it, asset class is basically what we're It's a completely illogical statement because it is the only thing that is guaranteed to give you back your money. Mm -hmm. And yet, you're getting that opposite kind of a thing. So it... I guess in markets like this, when you hear enough from someone that you should do something, don't keep cash, don't buy treasuries, uh, it's probably something you should seriously look at. So, so let's talk about that aspect to it. So, so that I, I think that just about everyone out there, all of our viewers, would say, look, you know, we'll give you that. As far as a diversification vehicle, cash and treasuries are a are a, a good investment to have. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if Looking at a, the larger portfolio, and if in, again, in order for me to grow my investments and to pay for my retirement in, you know, for the next 20 or 30 years, that I need an asset class that's going to appreciate as well. So, and that's where they're saying, therefore, I, I don't think the treasuries are going to be where I'm going to appreciate for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, which they have done extremely well, incidentally, for the last 30 years. There's, so, a, there's, so a, tremend about there's a tremendous convenience to this argument because the way we always set up this argument is, look, for the next 20 years, I've got this problem. If I don't make a... Wait a second. I don't know anything about the next 20 years. I only know what I started off by telling you, which is I don't like what I see around the world at the moment. And all of us have this obligation to our money, to our families, to our retirement, to say, I don't think I have to listen to these people about, don't worry, 20, and usually when people tell you 20 years from now something will be good, it's usually because it's not good today. It's always gonna be good 20, don't worry about it, it'll be good 20 years from now. <laughs> My sense is that it's like the cash question. You're not keeping cash just for 20 years, you're keeping cash today mm -hmm. because you don't think the price is good today or you think the price in the equity market has maybe gone too far today. But maybe next year, it'll be a good place to go. There's a, a not because I want to talk about equities, but there's a basic rule with equities and most people who have been around equities for a long time will tell you the time you want to invest, Warren Buffett was very lucky, he started investing in 1974, 1975. Mm -hmm. Most of those times that are very good, the price earnings multiple is, is very low. Is 
in single digits. Right. And so now, of course, everyone says, look, it's only 16 times earnings, only 15, or only 17 times, whatever it may be. And the fact of the matter is, the cash in that treasury doesn't mean it's your last investment, which is how people talk. My God, if you have cash in 20 years, it'll be worth nothing. The fact of the matter is, you're not talking 20 years. You're talking about, I, I, I don't feel comfortable today. And I think markets are like that. So what kind of returns do you think that we can get from treasuries? Uh, again, it, uh, I think, you know... And, and I, you know, it depends on which treasury and... Uh, everything you know. depends, to some extent, on that concept of savings and investing. If you ask me uh, if I invested in a treasury, meaning I, I am willing to take a little bit more risk, which means that you buy a little bit longer term, and we've discussed this before, there is no one in the industry who has beaten zero coupon strips, treasury strips, which in a sense pre-compound the money to you in mm -hmm. advance. So you pay a discounted price. No one. You buy, right, you pay a discounted price because you don't get the interest. You don't on, get the interest. Right. So you, just... you pay a discounted price, so whatever the price is right now. But right now, a 30-year uh, strip is yielding 4%. Mm -hmm. I bring this up to everyone. If the rates go down 1%, you will have made 25% on your money. Now, if you happen to be listening to me and you believe what I'm saying, that it's rational, the rates could go down 1%. I, I'm not saying they right. will, but I think they will. But, 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 but we could also, we and, just came through a p period of a couple of months where interest rates went up one, went up one four percent Absolutely. The, and the difference lost is, money, right. The difference is you didn't sell it anyway. You're not going anyplace, you're getting 4%. Okay, 4% is not good enough for you. You ask me, what can you make? Here's the worst case. You sit around, you get 4%. What's the best case? Robert Kessler's right, and you make 25%. That's if you hold it to maturity. 4% year after year to maturity. So the one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio uh, today, is? Today, it sounds like a very good investment today. I think 4% is, uh, is a very good rate. So it would be the 30-year U.S. Treasury strips, is that? Uh, absolutely. That would and I would have, I, I, look, I would have said this last year, too, right. which I probably did. I think did. you did. I probably <laughs> did. I'm very consistent <laughs> in saying this. If, if you're in the retirement business, uh, to explain this properly, if you're really retiring and you're putting money aside, let's just assume I'm totally wrong and the rates go to 6%. Then next year, you'll buy some more and you'll get 6%. And then the year after, they'll go back to two, you'll think about taking a profit. Or they'll go to 8% and you'll buy some at 8%. The, the purpose of an investment isn't to make a bet. I mean, the, 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 the purpose of that investment is it's a savings account. It's something that's meant to give you back your money. Now, hopefully you get a good return on it. I can't make that bet with anything else because I don't have a clue. And neither does anyone else. I mean, to suggest that the market's going to 20,000 or 25,000 in terms of the Dow Jones, we don't know that. But I can tell you, as long as the United States is here, you could play around with these treasuries. Now, how you want to do it, how much risk you want to take, how much savings you want to put aside, those are distinctly different things. And we will leave it there, Robert Kessler. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the other side <laughs> to this very popular thank you for, argument. Thank you for having me back to give it. Thank you. Delighted to have you. For those of you not familiar with the term STRIPS, the acronym stands for Separate Trading of Registered Interest and Principle of Securities. In the case of Robert Kessler's one investment recommendation, the U.S. Treasury STRIPS, also known as zero coupon bonds, are Treasury securities that have been stripped of their interest payments. They sell at a deep discount to their par value or the full principal amount you will get if you hold them until maturity. The rub is they get taxed as if you were getting annual interest payments, so they are best held in a tax-deferred account, and they are more volatile than their interest-paying brethren. Our action point this week picks up on Kessler's defense of bonds. It is don't abandon your entire portfolio of U.S. Treasuries or bonds. Absolutely review your bond positions and see if they meet your long-term income and diversification goals. If you feel more comfortable shortening maturities or reducing your bond exposure, do so. 
but recognize that bonds provide diversification, income, and relative stability over time. And as Kessler pointed out, U.S. Treasury securities provide liquidity, guaranteed income, a guaranteed return of principal at maturity, and are a non-correlated asset to stocks and other higher risk asset classes. Well, next week, we will have a TV exclusive with a top-ranked research team, a first-ever interview with global economist Nancy Lazar and investment strategist Francois Trohan, who recently joined forces to form their own macro research firm, Cornerstone Macro. If you have missed any of our past great investor or financial thought leader guests, you can find them on our website, WealthTrack.com, as well as access exclusive interviews and research in our WealthTrack Extra feature, including how Robert Kessler got involved in the Treasury bond business. In the meantime, have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter.